Hi all, so I'm Shavini Fernando, the founder and CEO of Oxywear, which is an ear wearable device that continuously monitors your oxygen levels and warns you as they fall too low. So I didn't come up with this concept overnight. My main point of coming with this concept was because of how my life was, because my life has been a complete roller coaster ride. I have severe cardiovascular disease and life is throwing so much of challenges at me and I was and I am still living on the edge but I got this far completely due to my positivity and perseverance. So if I rewind my life back by 10 years, I would have never even thought of Oxywell because I was a happy-go-lucky person just like everyone else, enjoying my life doing everything I love. I was a swimmer, I was an athlete, and I loved traveling, I loved adventure, and I was enjoying my life and having an awesome life back in Sri Lanka. I completed my undergraduate studies in computer science. I have a master's in computer science and an MBA, and I was working as a lecturer at an Australian university based in Sri Lanka. Until in October 2015, when the doctors told me that I have just two years to live. So my whole life, I have been having breathing issues. Sometimes I literally felt like I was breathing through a straw. But my entire life, for 33 years, I was diagnosed as an asthma patient. So just like any other asthma patient, I was walking around with my inhaler, doing everything I loved. In fact, even swimming and athletics, everything. But then in 2015, September, last week, when I went trekking with my boyfriend, he said, your face is turning blue. And then, just like anyone else, we consulted the Google doctor and then learned that it has nothing to do with my asthma, that something has to be wrong with my heart. So I went home and with my parents, went to a cardiologist and explained everything. And then he sent me to another hospital because he said, I need to get some invasive tests to figure out what's exactly wrong with me. And then after going through all those tests, that doctor who conducted my test came and very bluntly said, you have a severe cardiovascular disease, there's no treatment, and you have just two years to live. My whole family was devastated. But for me, I was more angry because I was trying to think, okay, who is he to decide how long I get to live? Because no one knows how everyone, like how long we get to live. So I questioned him, okay, maybe in Sri Lanka there is no medicine, but what if I go to Singapore or what if I go to USA? They might have treatments for me. And then very clearly he said, not here, not anywhere in the world. Wherever you go, there is no treatments. Just enjoy the two years you got. At that time, I literally felt like he was challenging me, that I had to prove him wrong. So I told him, I will be back in two years and I will come back and say hi to you. So the next week, exactly on my birthday, on October 11th, 11th my sister got an appointment at John Hopkins and I flew to USA looking for a second opinion. But then, because I flew for more than 18 hours, and I flew right after an invasive test. I ended up getting a stroke when they were running a test on me. And for three weeks, I was in the cardiac ICU at John Hopkins, Baltimore. And I literally felt like I was in a Grey's Anatomy live episode because so many wives hooked on to me and they were running so many tests on me. And it was a completely new experience because I have never been in hospital before. And after running all those tests, the doctors came and said, because I have had a hole in the heart from birth, I have, because I've got not diagnosed for 33 years, that I have Eisenmenger syndrome. So I have no wall between my two atriums, and I was with an extremely enlarged right heart and a hardly functioning left heart. And because of all that, I have severe pulmonary hypertension. 
So for a normal person, the pressure inside the arteries is just 20. But when I got diagnosed, my pressure was 128. Six times normal. So everyone keeps asking me, okay, what is pulmonary hypertension? So what pulmonary hypertension is when the pressure inside the arteries aren't more than 20. And mainly this happens when the arteries are thin and when it's difficult for the blood to flow in from your heart to the lungs. So for me what has happened was, because I have had a hole in my, between my two atriums, every time the heart was trying to pump blood to my body, a small amount of blood was leaking from my left atrium to the right atrium. Because in simple physics, it's always easier to, for the blood to flow from left to right than flowing from bottom to top. So over time, because of this leak, the wall started getting, the hole started getting bigger and more blood was flowing from my left atrium to the right atrium. So along with the deoxygenated blood, more oxygenated blood was also going back to my lungs. So the lungs were getting more blood than what it could handle. So in order to support this function, the lungs started adjusting on its own. So what happened was the lungs were getting its walls thicker. And then when the lung walls get thicker, what happens is even the artery walls get thicker, making the pressure higher inside the arteries. So for anyone with pulmonary hypertension, what happens is because of this pressure inside the arteries, in order to support the lungs, the right heart starts pumping. So over time, we end up with a highly enlarged right heart, causing right heart failure. So the definite therapy, in layman terms, I need a new engine. I need to get a both lungs and a heart transplant. And my whole family was more devastated now. And on top of that, I couldn't talk, I couldn't walk. Even when I brushed my teeth, I was going blue and I, can't, I couldn't breathe. I couldn't even walk 500 feet without going breathless or going blue. And then the doctors came and said that I can never swim again. And I can never go to high altitude, meaning I'm not going home again. And more than my parents, I was more scared because the doctor said, okay, will I get my organs? What would happen after the transplant? And how my life will be after the transplant? And on top of all that, will I ever get to go home? So the doctor put me on vasodilator medicine so that it will widen my arteries so that the blood would flow easily and said, let's see what happens. And then again I was thinking, okay, I have been having this before as well, but I was still enjoying my life. The only difference is now I know that I have this. So why would I let this disease take control of my life? Why would I adjust the way that I live just because now they said I have this? So along with my continuous oxygen concentrator, I started doing everything again. I started increasing my physical abilities and I started doing everything I loved because I wanted to get back my life. And then, while doing that, I joined Georgetown to start my third master's degree. And I was learning on virtual reality application development because I wanted to develop a software to gap the communication bridge between the doctors and the patients based on the experience I had with my doctors. And then I made friends, I was going out and I was living my life back again. And in fact, in 2017, January, I got my own apartment and I moved on my own and I started living independently. I was doing four to five jobs, I was studying and I was thriving. But again, in summer 2017, everything changed again. I was back to zero. Suddenly when I was working, my friends started to scream that my entire face was blue. And it didn't even take one minute. I couldn't breathe and my heart stopped. I had to hit my chest on my own and revive myself before I lost the oxygen supply to my brain. And my life was back at zero.
because doctors were worried, my parents were worried, my friends were worried. Everyone was scared whether it's safe for me to live alone, whether it's safe for me to do the five to six jobs that I was doing, to walk to Georgetown and do everything I was doing. So literally everyone was questioning my independence. And I didn't want to lose my independence because I just started my life again. So I was thinking to myself, okay, all this happened because the oxygen levels in my body dropped too low and I had no clue about it because I don't feel when the oxygen levels in my body drop too low. And what if there is a way that would monitor my oxygen, warn me as they go too low before it gets a critical time and then it will allow me to call 911 and get the help without having to depend on someone else. So I went back to my doctor at John Hopkins and told him, if I make a device like this, would that allow me to live independently doing everything the way I was doing before? And then he said, go ahead, do it, and we will help you. But then I was doing so many jobs, I was fighting for time. So I went back to Georgetown and I asked my program director, okay, I have this crazy idea. Can I do that as an independent study? Would you allow me to do that for credit? So that it will be a part of what I'm studying at Georgetown and I have to spend extra time for that. And they were so happy, they said, go ahead, do it and we will help you. So, fall 2017 semester, my whole semester was, okay, let's make this device. But then the new challenge. I was a software developer, I was a video game developer. I had no clue how to make hardware. I'm not a hardware engineer. So I went, Googled, checked on YouTube, read so many materials that everyone had posted, and learned, okay, how to make this? What sensors do I need? How do I so I sort of the parts? How do I make this? And then I was working as a makeup operations coordinator, so during my work shift at the maker space, and at, in the night, on my kitchen count, I started working and making this device. And by the end of fall semester, I actually made it. I was so happy because I made a device that is actually working. But then at that time, I made it just to help myself so I can get my life back. But not for my Maker Hub manager. He came and said, at Georgetown University, they have entrepreneur pitch competition, which is funded by the Ted Leonsis family, and no one has ever won that prize from the maker space, so I nominated you. I was like, okay, I had no clue how to pitch even at a startup pitch competition. And everything was so new. And this is when, oh shit, sorry. This is when I started on thinking of Oxyware as a venture. And I started thinking about, okay, how do I make this into a business now? I have no idea. And then when I was doing the research, only I learned that I am not alone in this fight. There's another 50 million people in US who's diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension due to COPD, cystic fibrosis, a heart disease, cirrhosis, or a congenital heart defect like mine. And all these people, they're scared to step out and live the normal life the way you do because we don't know when our oxygen levels would drop down and our hearts will stop. So if I give my device to this 50 million people as well, they also can go out and live and do the normal work they do without having to worry about the oxygen levels. Because then they can call 911 and get help without having to depend on anyone else. And then, ever since I made this, I have won so many pitch competitions and I have won so many awards. In fact, last week, I was listed as one of the DC Femtech Award winners, listed me among the 49 most influential women around DC in code design and engineering. And since I got diagnosed in 2015, I have come a long way. I have passed my two years that the doctor gave me. This is my fourth year. And now the John Hopkins doctors think that I can postpone my transplant for another five to ten years. And I don't wear my oxygen at all times, only when times like this when my heart rate rises. And 
I can walk faster than anyone. In fact, I go rock climbing now. And on top of that, whoever thought that I would be the CEO of a startup and listed among the 49 most influential women in DC. Now, if I settled for that verdict that my doctor gave me in 2015, I would have never come this far. If I settled for two years of my life, I would have not even made Doxyware. Just because I took his challenge as something to make me more stronger in a positive way, only I got this far. So people were questioning me, they were trying to define my life on how a person with oxygen should live. And even still I get some emails because when I remove this, no one would think I, am, I need a heart and a lung. So everyone keeps questioning me. Are you faking it? And I keep smiling. I'm like, think what you want. I just need a new engine, no one knows. So all this has helped me to be more stronger because I took everything in a positive attitude and all these opinions, I took them as catalyzers to make me more stronger and took everything in a positive way. And I was fighting all my way to make sure I live my life to the fullest. So my positivity and perseverance took me so far since 2015. And when I compare my time in high school to now, there's so many free materials and things that you can learn from. So if everyone starts looking at all the challenges in life as something that need to make a solution for, there's plenty of material that you can learn from and address that problem to create a solution for. And if I was able to look at my problem as a issue that I need to address, and I, if I was able to look at it in a positive attitude and fight for the way with my perseverance and create a solution for social good, even you can. Thank you.